Hampton Sides, welcome to the show. Great to be with you. So you just published a new military history book. It's about the Korean War on desperate ground, the Marines at the reservoir, the Korean War's greatest battle. It's about the Battle of the Chosen Reservoir. The thing about the Korean War is it's often the overlooked war in American history. People know about World War II, then there's the Korean War happened, and then there's Vietnam, and there's lots of movies and books about Vietnam. Why do you think the Korean War gets overlooked? Lots of reasons. I, I think one of them is that it's sometimes perceived as kind of uh, an addendum to World War II. You know, like it's this sort of unfinished business having to do with World War II that kind of kind of an afterthought or something like that. I think it's also perceived by some people as not being truly a war. That's, you know, sometimes it was called a police action, a UN police action, a conflict, but not a war that, you know, let me assure you, it was a war and it was a brutal and devastating war. And, and, you know, one that we're really feeling the consequences of still today. I think a a third reason why it's kind of forgotten is that it ended in a stalemate. It ended more or less where it began, which was at the 38th parallel, the, the line separating North and South Korea. And, you know, Americans, uh, we, we like to think we win wars. Vietnam was an exception, a war that we lost. But a stalemate is a hard narrative to get your head around. They say we died for a tie. And that they being the, the veterans of this battle and of uh, this war. And, uh, you know, I, I get that. It's just kind of, it's kind of a messy narrative, a complicated, unsettling narrative to understand. So those are, those are certainly some of the reasons. And we're technically still at war, correct? I and mean, there's just been an armistice, like we're just kind of, a, it's been put off for a bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and that too may be a reason why it's kind of a forgotten war is that it ended with this armistice that left so many of the questions unanswered. We're still kind of poised on the brink of war. It's a scary place. DMZ is a very scary place and, you know, a flashpoint that could erupt at any moment. And, you know, most of our wars that we fought, you know, have a very clear and definitive ending and, and, you know, it's got bookends and you understand what that was and it's over now. Korea is still kind of a, a cliffhanger. You know, it's still, it's still, there's still all these questions that need to be resolved. And that certainly, contributes to this provisional quality, I guess, that the whole war has in, in our national consciousness. You know, it's like, it ain't over yet. Well, it's, because it's overlooked, it's the forgotten war, I think a lot of Americans don't even understand how we got involved in it. So can you kind of give us like a thumbnail sketch of like how we ended up yeah. in Korea? Well, it's a complicated thing, and I'll try to do the 101 kind of version of it. Okay, so after World War II, the Allied powers were tasked with the responsibility of, you know, deciding what to do with the spoils of the Japanese empire. And Korea had been a colony of Japan, of imperial Japan. And the Japanese had just brutally mistreated the Koreans, but it was their colony. So the Soviets kind of got into that theater of the war very late in the game. We're, We're very interested in the northern part of Korea. And we were interested in the southern part of Korea, and we decided to draw a line right down the middle, the waist of the country, the 38th parallel. We would take the South temporarily. The Soviets would take the North temporarily. But the idea was that we would have an election and the country would be reunited and decide its own fate. Well, that never happened. Very quickly, the North became shaped in the image of its custodian nation, Soviet Union under Stalin. In fact, Kim, the grandfather of the current Kim, you know, studied at the knee of the master, Stalin himself, in terms of authoritarian dictatorship and the cult of personality and all that sort of stuff. He uh, built up his army with Soviet tanks and Soviet artillery. Meanwhile, in, in the South, we, we were the custodian nation, but we really didn't arm South Korea very well. And we were interested in South Korea partly because we were rebuilding Japan. And Korea was right there so close to Japan that it was important to to have a relationship with with South Korea. But on June 25th, 1950, Kim Il-sung surprised everyone by racing across the border and taking Seoul. And there was a blitzkrieg. They, They pushed the South Korean army almost to the very end of the peninsula. And the U.S. 
entered this war to defend the South Koreans and their anemic army. And we held on for dear life for a few months in the summer of 1950, and then finally got involved in a big way in September of 1950 by invading the port of Incheon. And we retook Seoul. We pushed Kim Il-sung's forces all the way back to the 38th parallel. And if we stopped right there, it would have been a three-month war. We would have accomplished all our goals. Millions of lives would have been spared, and it would have been, uh, I think, perceived universally as a, as a great success. But we got greedy. We, we pushed beyond the 38th parallel. We decided to do in reverse what Kim had done, which was to take all of the peninsula, but this time for the South and for the American interests. And we pushed all the way to the Yellow River, the border with Manchuria, and the, the Chinese got very nervous about that. And Manchuria is China. So Mao, having recently won his civil war, the most populous nation on earth, decided to enter this conflict in a big way. And that's sort of setting the stage for the Battle of Chosen Reservoir. All right. So let's, there's a lot to unpack there. And there's also a lot of yeah. personalities going on here, which you get into a lot in the book. So sort of the mastermind of the, this invasion to repel North Korea was MacArthur, right. who had a controversial career in World War II. But during this time, he was, I guess, kind of, he was like the um, sort of like General Eisenhower of the Pacific, correct? Except a much more dramatic, a much more grandiose form of Eisenhower. You know, he could, at this point, seemingly could do no wrong. He, I don't think we've ever had a commander that had concentrated in, you know, in his office, in his person, so much power because he was the head of the UN forces. He was the head of the army of the Far East. He was running the occupation of Japan. He was essentially functioning as an emperor. And he was, yeah, he kind of had an imperial personality to begin with. A very dramatic guy, very old school military leader, you know, whose, whose command style, you know, frankly just doesn't hold up very well in sort of today's culture. You know, it was all about him. He, you know, he they, they used to say he, he loved the vertical pronoun. I shall return, you know, it was all about him. And, you know, the way he used media and the way he had an entourage everywhere he went and the way he, you know, surrounded himself with yes men who just told him what he wanted to hear. He was a little past his expiration date at this point. He had a long and interesting and an amazing career, but this was near the very end. And I think it, it had all gone to his head and he just thought he could just, you know, kick ass and, and just, just take Korea and it would be super easy and didn't think the Chinese would intervene. And even if they did, it'd be so easy to, you know, and, and, and of course he wanted to use nuclear weapons against China when they, when they did intervene, they just blow up Beijing, no problem. Uh, you know, he had, he had by this point become a, a very, I think a very scary dude in the sense of just being, you know, so much power in this one guy and, and Truman, President Truman didn't really know how to handle him. And the Joint Chiefs of Staff in Washington didn't really know how to handle him. It was, uh, it was like a one-man show. Well, this initial idea of invading or, you know, repelling uh, the, the Americans coming in and helping the South Koreans, that was MacArthur's idea, correct? Well, no, not just MacArthur. I, I think everyone agreed that we, you know, we had pledged in various ways to defend this fledgling democracy. We certainly didn't want it to become a communist peninsula. I think history has proven that we were right, that, you know, that Kim was an unusually malevolent dictator, and you only have to go to Korea today to see the difference between South Korea and, and North Korea, and, and, and certainly, you know, Seoul has become this just amazingly dynamic city. It's, it's uh, South Korea's the 11th largest economy in the world. So, you know, I think if you ask veterans of the Korean War today, should we have been there? Were we doing the right thing? Almost invariably, they'll all say yes, up to the point where we came to the 38th parallel. Going beyond the 38th parallel is where all the problems really, you know, begin. But anyway, yeah, MacArthur wanted to do this, but so did Truman. And, and, and uh, you know, everyone wanted to defend South Korea. It's just that line. It's like once you cross that line, you go into a much more complicated uh, narrative. And that's where MacArthur, he kind of said, we were successful here. We kicked butt. Why don't we just keep going? Yeah, the Inchon invasion was enormously successful. 
surprise the North Koreans. Kim was on the run, you know, but he said, well, we need to pursue Kim into his own territory and, and destroy the remnants of his army. So he can't do this again. Okay, fair enough. But let's keep going. Let's take Pyongyang. Let's take uh, other cities in North Korea. And then ultimately, let's go all the way to the border with China. Well, the analogy the Chinese would use is that, you know, what if the Chinese had invaded Mexico and pushed all the way to the Rio Grande? What would we have done? Well, we would have entered the war preemptively. And that's what they did in a big way. And, you know, it was the beginning of what people feared would be World War Three, And but were there people around MacArthur, like other generals and chiefs of staff who were like, that's not a good idea. You should not do that. Uh, you know, there were some people who voiced concerns, but his immediate, his immediate staff know that, you know, he had surrounded himself with, with sycophants who told him what he wanted to hear and agreed with them. And the foremost among them was this guy, General Ned Almond, who is his commander on the ground in Korea. And this is part of the problem. You see, MacArthur was not on the ground in Korea. He would fly over occasionally for a photo op from Tokyo. And, you know, it said that he never slept a single night on Korean soil during the Korean War. So he's a classic example of an absentee commander. And, you know, he just was out of touch with reality. And, and really, that's where a lot of the problems lie. So he didn't have, he didn't have people disagreeing with him in a, in a you know, vigorous way to adjust his view of things. Well, you, you mentioned like, you know, Truman didn't know how to handle MacArthur. You also had Marshall who mm-hmm. seemed like he didn't really know how to handle MacArthur either. And he kind of gave him the rubber stamp on, on this, this, you know, going past the 38th parallel. Why do you think Marshall did it? He just didn't know what to do with MacArthur just well, just let him do it. I, it's complicated. A lot of different reasons. Uh, certainly people didn't know how to handle MacArthur's personality in general. And there was of course a political dimension to that, which is that it was thought widely thought that MacArthur was gearing up to run for president uh, back in the States, you know, after the war. So he was a live wire in that sense. McCarthy had just sort of risen his ugly head that year. McCarthyism was a factor in American politics and the Democratic Party and Truman in particular had been accused widely of, of being soft on communism. So that was another factor that plays into the calculus here. You want to appear to be soft on communism. So, you know, push to the Yalu, go all the way. And then the fact is that everybody wanted to unite Korea as a democratic, capitalistic, pro-American peninsula. Everybody wanted that. Truman certainly wanted that. It would have been great, I think, ultimately for the North Korean people, as we've come to see under Kim, what has happened. But the intelligence began to trickle in in the fall of 1950 that the Chinese not only were going to enter, but had entered in hundreds of thousands of Chinese and millions were, were moving to Manchuria to get in place. And MacArthur didn't want to hear this, didn't want to believe the intelligence, and actual, his lieutenants actively doctored a lot of this evidence. So, you know, really, it's one of the greatest military intelligence failures in our history. And ultimately, it's MacArthur's fault. Yeah, there were, you, you mentioned a meeting that Truman and MacArthur had. And Truman, you know, straight up said, if, if the Chinese ever get involved, like, we're not doing this anymore. Right. And Tr- MacArthur's like, well, yeah, it's not going to happen. It's, we're ill yeah. be fine. Yeah, I mean, these two men whose fates are so closely intertwined actually only met one time, only once. And they flew in opposite directions to this little island in the middle of the Pacific, Wake Island, and had this very strange meeting for a couple hours. And they talked about this very question, what to do if the Chinese enter the war and MacArthur was quite confident. He said, they will not enter. Don't worry. They're not going to enter. And even if they do, we'll slaughter them. You know, basically they're just a bamboo army. You know, they're just a you know peasant army. We've got planes, we got tanks, we got, you know, we got modern communications. We're going to, we're going to kick them back across the yellow very quickly. It'll be over by Christmas. And Truman, you know, loved hearing that, of course. And, but what Truman said is, as soon as you get an inkling that the Chinese really are entering in large numbers, stop. Halt in your tracks and take a position you can hold and go no further. Well, MacArthur didn't do that. 
So you mentioned MacArthur was sort of an absentee commander, um, didn't sleep a night in North Korea. But there was one guy who was the most involved in the initial evasion and also, you know, moving the men past the 38th parallel, and that was Major General Oliver Smith. Now, I never knew about Smith until I read your book, but this guy was amazing. Tell us about him. Yeah. Well, he's kind of the, well, not kind of, he's definitively the, the pro- protagonist of of the book. He, he's an amazing general that you say you had heard of him. Most people hadn't heard of him. I hadn't heard of him until I got into this project. He is the commander of the 1st Marine Division. He's a field general. And, you know, he's one of those guys that we need to listen to more often in these battles, in these wars. The field generals on the ground who know what's happening and know how to fight at the ground level and, and care about the fate of, of their men. General Smith was known as the professor. He was not your typical gung-ho Marine, you know, macho guy. He, he, he was an academic. He was constantly smoking a pipe. He was fluent in French. He'd studied all over the world. He, he taught classes at Quantico and, uh, you know, at Pendleton and, and had, um, he, he graduated from Berkeley. And, you know, he was kind of a cerebral guy, and, but he had also fought in some ferocious battles of World War II, including uh, Peleliu and Okinawa. And he was a master of uh, amphibious landings. It, that was really what he knew the most about. And, and so consequently, with the Inchon invasion, he was the guy called in to, to design the landing. And, and amphibious landing is a very, very complicated thing. You know, it's three-dimensional. And there's planes, there's artillery, there's ships, so there's, you know, men coming in from, from the seawall. It all has to be timed perfectly, and then there's huge tidal fluctuations at Inchon that had to be, you know, figured out. And he, uh, in, in, in tandem with the, the Navy, you know, figured this thing out. It worked brilliantly. They got ashore the first day, and they took Inchon very quickly and surprised the North Koreans. So Smith, I saw Smith through Inchon into Seoul. They take Seoul, and, you know, very quickly the war is going to be over, they think. But then they start going north, into North Korea. His 1st Marine Division actually is brought onto ships again, and they, they go around the peninsula and then up the east coast of North Korea and land at a place called Hungnam. And we follow them as they, they push up this narrow road into the mountains of North Korea toward a man-made lake, a reservoir, the Chosen Reservoir, where where this battle ultimately uh, takes place. Uh, we'll, we're going to talk about this battle because it's one of the most epic battles. And the way you describe it, it's, uh, it's just, it was, so ca- it was captivating. But let me, let's talk about Smith and MacArthur, these two personalities that were almost like polar opposites. Right. Um, how did how did Smith manage MacArthur? Because there was instances where, you know, he'd hear something from MacArthur and it would go through Almond, and then Smith would kind of be like, nah, I'm not, I'm not going to do that, but still, like, make it look like he was doing it. Yeah. Well, there's always been this rivalry between the Marines and, you know, uh, other branches of service. And here's a Marine being told to do something that Smith fundamentally disagrees with. He thinks it's, it's, it's a trap. It's, it's a classic ambush situation to push up a narrow mountain road, twisting through this. And it's the only way to go. There's only one road. So his army is going to get, and so his Marines are going to um, disperse along this road. And it's a perfect situation for an encirclement and an entrapment, you know, and by this point he knew the Chinese were there in large numbers somewhere in those mountains. So, but, you know, but, but General Smith doesn't want to be accused of insubordination. He can't really violate the order. So he, he kind of meets halfway. He slows down deliberately. And MacArthur is saying, hey, go, 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 as fast as you can go. But Smith is slowing down. He's, he's starting to, to fortify certain towns and, and create strongholds for a battle that he knows is coming. He decides to start building an airstrip up in the mountains in the middle of nowhere. Why do you need an airstrip up there? They said, well, he said, well, you know, just in case we need to bring in planes for a battle and to bring out the casualties that we're going to have from a battle. It's almost like, you know, all these place, all these pieces are coming into place for a major battle that only General Smith seems to be able to see. The others, MacArthur and Allman, just doesn't think there's going to be a battle, just 
don't worry about it. Just go as fast as you can headlong to the Yalu. So, you know, their personalities are very different. I, I spent a lot of time kind of comparing and contrasting Smith's very cautious personality with the rash and reckless personality of General Almond, who is really just doing the bidding the ultimate commander, MacArthur. I and mean, speaking of, you know, the Chinese and their, their military strategy, I mean, it seems like, yeah, they were setting the Americans up for an ambush. Like, they, like Mao was using Sun Tzu and all that. So, like, he was a big, you know, disciple of these guys, and he was really thinking hard. That was another, I thought that was interesting. I didn't know that about this part of military history. Yeah, well, Mao was quite actively involved in the strategy and prided himself on being a great military strategist. And during the Civil War, his long, prolonged Civil War against the nationalist forces under Chiang Kai-shek, Mao had proved to be, you know, quite adept. And yeah, he liked, he liked to read the classics. He liked to read, he liked to read Sun Tzu. And, you know, using the element of surprise, you know, guerrilla tactics, marching overland, avoiding the roads, moving only at night, stealth, flexibility of movement, all these things he was going to employ in the Battle of Chosen Reservoir as well. Mao is following these movements from afar. He's in Beijing at this point, of course, but his generals are in close contact with him. And the Chinese, you know, and this is, I have to say that, you know, in fairness to MacArthur, the Chinese were very difficult to spot from the air. And one of the reasons for this intelligence failure was that in the first month or so, they they were just, they were almost impossible to detect. They came across the Yalu, they moved only at night, they slept during the day, they foraged off the land, they didn't build fires that could be spotted from the air. And so consequently, they had moved into place very surreptitiously, and they were they were just really good at what they what they did. They they didn't have great weapons, they didn't have great communications, they didn't have modern you know a modern army or vehicles of any sort. But they had the element of surprise, and they had overwhelming numbers, and and that's sort of setting the stage for 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 the battle. Well, just to reiterate, like they went undetected, and there's like hundreds of thousands of them, which is mind boggling. <laughs> mind boggling that we still didn't know that they were there. And, <laughs> and we, we, we started to find out we, we had skirmishes and we capture some of these guys and they would say, very frankly, you know, we're, we're from China. We're Chinese. We're Mao's troops. There's thousands, hundreds of thousands of us. We were going to, they were, had actually been trained to attack Taiwan and were almost, you know, to the point of getting on, ships to go to Taiwan when they got this other order. No, we're going to go north to Manchuria and we're going to cross the Yellow and we're going to defend Kim and his communist forces and we're going to attack the imperialist Americans. That's what they did. They were very frank about all this and the marine intelligence folks would send it up the food chain to Tokyo and, and MacArthur's guys would just look at this and say, no, these aren't Chinese. They can't be Chinese. Chinese aren't there. Uh, they're volunteers. There, there must be North Korean, North Koreans who speak Chinese or Manchurian volunteers who've just come across the border for their own, you know, just to help their brethren. They aren't Mao's troops. Don't worry about it. And it's a, that's, that's where it just, it ceases to be an intelligence failure and it becomes a leadership failure, I think. Uh, you know, it's just willful ignorance. All right, so the Marines, they head up, they, they get near the, the Chosen Reservoir. Like summer, fall, or summer, like through September in North Korea, you know, it's warm, pretty temperate. But then like November hits and the weather changes dramatically. Tell us about the conditions about at the Chosen Reservoir. Yeah, you know, I, I just don't think that any of us realize then and, and still today, I don't think people realize how cold it gets in North Korea you know, bitter, bitter, bitter cold. Uh, suddenly in November, winter fell and it got down to 20 below zero and the winds were just howling out of the steps of Manchuria. We just weren't prepared for it. Our equipment wasn't prepared for it. The guns wouldn't fire properly. The artillery wouldn't register properly. Vehicles shut down. It just took people's breath away. And, you know, people started freezing to death and hypothermia and you know it affects your decision making you know it became the cold became this third combatant 
you know, there was the Chinese, there was Americans, and then there, and there was this old man winter that, you know, just affected everybody. It affected the Chinese even more profoundly than the Americans. They were really were not equipped. Many of them didn't have gloves. They were wearing these sort of tennis shoes. The Chinese were that, uh, you know, they slipped on, they didn't have socks. It was just devastating to them. And, and people, people began to freeze to death. And, you know, these guys, the, the Marines who were there called themselves the frozen chosen because, you know, this was a battle that was just fought under these incredible winter conditions for 17 days. Consequently, a huge percentage of them, about 85% of them suffered some form of frostbite. They lost fingers and toes and, and parts of their face. And, uh, you know, after the, after the war, they, <laughs> so many of the ones I interviewed, they almost all settled in places like Florida and Southern California because they just really could not deal with the cold. So yeah, it's a, it's a big factor of, of this, uh, of this battle. And, you know, in the old days when armies encountered this kind of weather, they would kind of shake hands and agree to meet in the spring and go to some place like Valley Forge. But here they just kept going and, you know, with, with devastating results. Yeah. Talk about what it was like. So there's hundreds of thousands of Chinese. How many Marines were there at the Chosen Reservoir? There were about 13,000 right there around the shores of this lake, which is by this point frozen solid. You know, in fact, some of the battle happens out on the ice, which is kind of amazing. And there's another seven or 8,000 Marines down in the valley by the sea supporting them. But they're surrounded by, you know, 10 to 1 in many parts of the battlefield by the Chinese who had, you know, to their credit, very successfully lured the, the Marines up into this area. And then they surrounded them, truly surrounded them. And then they finally attack in force on the night of November 27th. And, you know, they only attacked at night because they were terrified of American air power. So they couldn't be spotted at night. Of course, the planes couldn't fly at night. So they'd come around midnight and it'd be this sort of cacophony of, of bells and whistles and drums and bugles. And they'd come over the hills in waves. You know, it's just the Marines are holding on for dear life, trying to absorb this attack all through the night. And by dawn, uh, the attacks would relent and, and they would sort of disappear into the hills and you wouldn't see them until the next night. Well, this goes on, you know, for for over a week, of just trying to absorb these ama- these these incredible attacks until the Marines can figure out what to do next. No, and the the carnage. I, I mean, it was like it was Homeric. It was biblical. I mean, just bodies, thousands of bodies, just like heaped on each other. It was. I mean, you, you yeah, you know, war is bad, but like I, you never, I never read anything of, like this before. Yeah. Well, you know, the Chinese were either incredibly brave or. They were just incredibly uh, driven by their commanders. And, you know, Mao treated his men like cannon fodder. I mean, just, we'll make more. We'll, we'll, just, we'll just send in more and more and more people. And he was willing to sustain casualties that we would consider obscene. And so they would, these waves would come. And, you know, the Marines were, had to resort very quickly to hand-to-hand combat. And so a lot of these... A lot of this combat happened with shovels and bayonets and knives and pistols in the dead of night in 20 below zero weather on, you know, beneath the glare of these, of these flares against the light of the snow, you know, the, the light coming off the snow. Uh, so it was a very eerie environment to, to have to fight in. And, and, you know, as you said, the corpses would just pile up. The Marines really couldn't dig foxholes because it because the soil was frozen solid. So they ended up using these corpses as, as windbreaks, as sandbags almost. And uh, they just pile them up and they'd hide behind the corpses and, and keep fighting through the night. So, you know, you talk to these Marines, they, they talk about a lot of things and have a lot of nightmares about a lot of different aspects of this, but they talk a lot about that. It was just like corpses everywhere. You know, there's a, you know, and they froze solid in the shape that they had fallen in. So it's really quite ghastly. And, you know, these corpses are just lying around for all 17 days of the battle. It's, 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 it's it was quite ghoulish, really. And, you know, just one, one, of, one of many extreme aspects of this, of, of this battle. 
So the, the battle started in November. It lasted 17 days. But there was a point where the Americans decided, like, we have to retreat. They didn't call it that, but that's effectively what it was. At what point did the Americans decide they had to get out of the Chosen Reservoir? Well, you know, it was it was pretty apparent even after the first night that they had to regroup in some way, that they weren't going to be marching to the Yalu anymore. It took MacArthur several more days to finally re- agree, yeah, we can't march Hell, we, we can't even defend what we, where we are. We certainly aren't going to march to the Yalu. But how you do that is a, is a very tricky thing. It's probably the trickiest thing in warfare is, you know, how, how do you successfully march you know, out? How do you retreat? The Marines hate to use the word retreat. And, you know, of course, there's a lot of euphemisms for retreat, advance to the rear, <laughs> retrograde maneuver. It was General Smith who famously said, you know, we're not retreating, we're simply attacking in another direction, which I love. And, but, you know, but what he really meant by that was that if you are surrounded by overwhelming numbers of the enemy who are trying to kill you, movement in any direction is an attack. You're going to fight your way out. He knew it would be a fight. And, you know, if they had to march 70 miles to the sea where they, where there was this port, Hung Nam, where they could regroup, hold the port, and stage stage an evacuation like Dunkirk, which is what they did, of course. But that becomes the rest of the story. The rest of the book is is, is this incredibly well choreographed fighting withdrawal down this one mountain road, the same road they had marched up. And they now have to march out of, and they do it with air power. They do it with artillery. They build this airfield and get their casualties out, they bring in supplies, and they kind of systematically break down these enclaves and and move towards the coast in an organized fashion. They didn't want to just turn and run. They wanted to fight their way out in a systematic way. And, And that's exactly what they did, and that's why this battle is so widely embraced and studied by the Marines. It's a perfect example of a fighting withdrawal. And, you know, they got out of there intact with their equipment, they got their casualties out of there, and they got to the coast and lived to fight another day. Within another few months, they're, they're fighting again in the Korean War, the 1st Marine Division. And, and yet, they, you know, just a few weeks earlier, they were really on the brink of possibly being annihilated. The newspapers back home said as much, that they were a doomed legion, lost legion. There was just no way they were going to get out of this trap. So, you know, that's really what the book about. It's about how they got themselves into a trap and then how they fought their way out. And in, in this, you know, you know, fighting out of this trap, there was, you know, lots of amazing stories of ordinary men doing extraordinary things. Was there, is there one that you could, you know, maybe share with us that st- stands out to you? Well, wh- one of the cool things about this battle is the extent to which it was an engineering story. You know, some of the heroes of this battle are engineers particularly this, the chief marine engineer, a guy named Partridge, who had been asked to build this airfield. And we're not talking about just a little airstrip for you know Cessnas or something. They built a huge airfield to bring in these big transport planes in the middle of nowhere, I mean, just in the wilderness. And you know, people said it couldn't be done, didn't have enough equipment, uh, couldn't find the exact place to do it. The, 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 of course, the ground is frozen solid. And this General Smith gets Partridge in on it. They look at the place. They figure out, yeah, maybe we can do it. They bring in bulldozers and grading equipment, which keeps breaking because it's just it's like granite. The, the soil is so uh, hard. And uh, then around the clock, under the glare of these you know, floodlights, they start scraping this airfield. And they barely make it in time, but they finally get it built and graded and they still don't know if it's going to really work but the planes start coming in and it's sort of just in the nick of time and and uh start bringing in all these supplies and ammunition and medical supplies in the midst of the battle and what's amazing is these bulldozer operators are are scraping the earth and periodically shutting down their equipment and picking up their rifle and shooting i mean they're they're fighting a battle while operating earth moving equipment. And it's just kind of, it's just, it's kind of amazing. And, and then a little later in the battle, 
Partridge gets asked to do something even more extreme, which is the Chinese had blown a bridge at a key choke point that, you know, everyone knew if they blew this bridge, we're in trouble. The Marines are backed up for 10 miles or more and they can't move because the bridge has been blown. So Partridge gets called in to build a bridge in the middle of a battle. They fly in these huge girders by, and drop them by parachute. And these engineers are, you know, out kind of like acrobats, like swinging from this precipice, building this bridge while fighting a battle. And they get it built in, in, a, few, in a few short hours and hold the bridge long enough for, for 13,000 Marines to come out. And then they blow the bridge up so the Chinese can't use it. So that's one of the many stories. You know, this is, this is a, one of the most highly decorated battles in American history. And there's all these little set pieces all, all over the battlefield like this. People who won Congressional Medal of Honor, people who are in the thick of the fighting. And, you know, I guess the hardest part of doing this book for me was picking and choosing, you know, which of those individual stories those sort of stories on the ground level, the grunts, which ones to tell. So uh, this was the war with most decorated battle. But besides that, what do you think the legacy of the the Frozen Chosen is? Well, uh, you know, people who have heard of it just think of think of it as being like, okay, we should never fight in these, these kinds of conditions again. We should never put ourselves in these these sorts of conditions. I, I think you know, I view this as a sort of tragic collision of forces. Those armies shouldn't have been up there in that place. We, it happened because diplomacy failed. It, it happened because we didn't do the hard, messy work of diplomacy. We didn't have a relationship with, with the most populous nation on earth. We refused to recognize Mao as the uh, legitimate leader of, of China. We had no back channels of communication. He sent ample signals to us that he was going to intervene. We just kind of ignored those signals. And so, I mean, I, I, I think of the legacy of, of this battle as being first and foremost, kind of exhibit a of, of the failure, you know, what happens when, when diplomacy fails and the other legacy that I really look at here is, is, you know, just how important it is to listen to your field commanders, the, the guys who are on the ground, who have the intelligence, who know what's happening, you know, listen to them and keep a channel of communication from the bottom up, not just from the top down. This whole thing could have avoided, this whole thing could have been avoided if we had listened to what General Smith had to say. Well, Hampton, where can people go to learn more about the book and your work? Well, uh, my website is hamptonslides.com and the book is published by Doubleday. Anywhere where books are sold, you can, you can find it. Well, Hampton Sides, thanks for your time. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed it. My guest here is Hampton Sides. He's the author of the book On Desperate Ground. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. You can find out more information about his work at his website, hamptonsides.com. Also check out our show notes at aom.is slash Korean War, where you can find links to resources where you can delve deeper into this topic.